This is Adam Gorney, the National Recruiting Director for Rivals, here with a very special guest today, Agent Lee Steinberg, um, who's very well known in the industry, has been for many decades. And uh, Lee, thanks for joining me. And before we get started on like, the seri more serious topics, let's talk a little Jerry Maguire stuff. And I, I you know, at a TED Talk, you once said that the the real story of Cuba Gooding Jr. was Tim McDonald, you know, told uh, told you guys what he wanted, and then. Cameron Crowe made it, you know, the Hollywood version. But it, it, can, can you recap that story for us a little bit? So Cameron Crowe, who is a director writer of Jerry Maguire, called me up in 1993 and asked if he could follow me for a film he was putting together, which would feature a sports agent. So everywhere I went for the next year and a half, he went to the NFL draft to the league meetings in Palm Desert. And there I was showing off Tim McDonald, who was an unrestricted free agent trying to get teams interested in him. And at one point, uh, he was staying at the hotel and Cameron went up into his hotel room and was interviewing Tim. And he said, what are you looking for in this experience? What are you trying to find? And uh, Lou Dobbs and Moneyline was on CNN in the background. And Tim gestured sort of the screen and said, I'm looking for a team to show me some uh, love. I'm looking for a team to show me some winning because I never won before. And then he said, I'm looking for a team to show me the money. <laughs> and he took that line, huh? And so, you know, Cameron's take on it is he wrote the line and Tim believes he said it. But either way, it goes into uh, iconic film history. When you saw that movie, when it came out, obviously it's a Hollywood version of someone's, you know, real life and, and Tom Cruise. How accurate is it? How crazy is that world? And how reflective of it was it when you saw it on the screen? Well, it wasn't going to be biographical on me because I started with the first pick in the first round in the 1975 draft. And that doesn't make for a very good uh, dramatic arc, you know, with <laughs> struggle and, and the rest of it. Um based on a lot of the discussions that I had with him. And I think that the uh, positive of it was that it humanized the whole field of sports agentry. And he saw the relationship I had with Warren Moon and some other players for a long period of time and the real caring that was there. And uh, then I was a uh, technical advisor, so I had to vet the script to make sure the willing suspension of disbelief that holds you in a motion picture. So you don't think the dialogue's phony. You don't think the look on the field is phony. Didn't get broken. And then he made me take actors like Cuba Gooding Jr. Uh, down to the Super Bowl in Phoenix. And he had to pretend he was a wide receiver all week. Uh, he hung out with Desmond Howard and Amani Toomer. And he had to put himself into roles. So, um, I've never walked into a public place in 25 years without someone running up and and either asking me to say or saying those four words to start with, show me the... Right, right. I thought maybe you complete me or taking a fish in a bag to the elevator. Or help me help you. Help me help you. Right, right. Exactly. So you had me at hello. You right, all, all the good ones. Let's talk a little um, NIL, obviously something that you're kind of knee deep in, getting more and more involved in. First, your thoughts on it, how it's kind of been rolled out, and is it uh, has it found its due time here? It exploded, Adam, uh, since July 1st. No one uh, could have predicted. I thought it was going to be pretty expansive, but no one really thought that it would engage this number of players at this many programs from all across the country. So I'm over in Hawaii now, and at the University of uh, Hawaii, the quarterback did a NIL with uh, a bank. And so on the front page of the, of the paper, the front page of the paper ran this fellow's picture and the name of the bank. And then as you open the sports section, it had the first story was that. So this bank obviously got exactly what it was looking for. There are uh, internet groups that have offered every single athlete $100 or every single group. There are people like Phil Knight who's done a deal with the entire Oregon uh, team. So uh, there are female athletes that are benefiting. We signed uh, the Oklahoma quarterback, uh, 
Spencer Rattler, who um, I thought might be the top beneficiary from this because it would be big schools with big alumni backing. Remember that in a way it's a recruiting device. So when you saw Nick Saban say that his quarterback um, had just made a million dollars in endorsements, obviously under ordinary circumstances, he'd been saying, oh, well, this quarterback, you know, he's got to prove stuff. He's got to do things. He's never played it down yet. But there's a recruiting benefit to a university that can say, if you come here, you'll be making lots of money off the field. So it's um, been really broad and expansive with many, much more depth in terms of not just the quarterback, but a number of players on uh, football teams and then uh, in women's sports and, um, and we'll see more. The affinity groups, like if you're an alum of the University of Alabama, you want to support the football team you can, and you own a business, you can um, have one of the athletes there uh, uh, advertise your product. It's the same as a scholarship support, really. And, and that's really one of the questions, Lee, and I think some of the hesitation going into NIL was they don't want it to be an impetus for guys to somehow behind the scenes be paying to get recruits to their school. Is there any way to dodge that with the school or the NCAA sort of policing it as best as they can, or have the floodgates been open to the point now where that is going to be part of the process that we're just going to have to live through? If I'm an alum and I own a business in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, who's to tell me that I'm not getting benefit out of an association with the University of Alabama football team? It's the biggest thing around. And if uh, someone wants to characterize it as a disguised contribution to the program, well, that's their business. But there's certainly a business uh, purpose to this. Right after pro football, which is the most popular game, college football is the most popular sport in this country. And if you take a big affinity group like Ohio State or Michigan or SC or Notre Dame or Texas or Alabama, um, those alums are dying to have uh, an identification with players from the team. And, it, and for some of them, it's good enough to just have the University of Texas player affiliation, whether or not the public happens to really know that player because the pro- uh, program has so much prominence. One of the issues is, let's say in the life of Patrick Mahomes, the first couple of years, we didn't um, advise him to do any endorsements because you wanted his play on the field to set the standard and prove to everyone he was serious about football mm-hmm. before going ahead and having his picture on every billboard. So the question then that's raised is if the incoming quarterback who's a freshman is going to start and he's never played a single down yet and there are billboards advertising him, then what happens when he throws the first interception? What happens when he throws the second? It's a learning curve. He's just at the start of the learning curve and yet you put all this pressure. Another question is um, it's a team sport. So how does the offensive lineman feel if the quarterback's making a million dollars and never play to play? So, I mean, you do have issues there. Uh, and the football performance has to come first. And so now Patrick Mahomes is MVP of the league. He takes his team to the Super Bowl. Now you feel like he's put enough bonds down in the community for all that. But it does put a lot of pressure on a player. That is interesting. An interesting point, kind of advising to hold off on that sponsorship money over the long term, that will pay itself off. It's also kind of easy for us to say that sitting sort of a comfortable life and a kid going to Clemson or Alabama who might need some of that money early on. But it's but it's certainly a, a balance there. So if you were a parent advising your kid, would you say you're going to Alabama? Just wait on that NIL stuff. Don't sign that Bojangles deal just yet because once you prove yourself and become incredibly popular nationally, then that then the real money starts coming. Well, years ago, I discovered with players like Troy Aikman and Steve Young that if you waited, if you could afford to wait, but remember, they had both signed pro contracts. So they were 
financially well fixed. I'm not going to lecture some young man who comes from a disadvantaged home and then has to send part of the scholarship check home to his parents. The inequity has always been that the non-athletic peers that player has on the campus can do better financially because they can work during the school year, which sure. the player can't work, and, and, and it's not really practical to work during the summer. So, yes, there are non-athletic students who have uh, circumstances, but they also get uh, scholarships and they also get grants and they can work. And so if you stick a player in a big city where the standard of living is really high, scholarship check doesn't go very far. And they're sitting, have been sitting for years in stadia that's full, watching massive television contracts being negotiated and seeing their jersey number for sale in the student store for which they receive nothing. Yeah. Or have received nothing until July. Sure, sure. When, when I started kind of researching NIL a lot and, and writing about it and kind of really getting a grasp of it, I really thought at first this was going to be the big city schools, USC, Miami, maybe Texas as the ones that really were the kids made the money. But as I went through this, I learned it might be the Clemson, South Carolina, the Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Or, but it seems like now that that both both are benefiting in their own way. Do you do you see it one way or the other? Or is it really just the acceptance and 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 the kind of opportunities that prov provide themselves wherever they go to school? I think there are two factors. Number one, is this a team that plays nationally televised football games or regionally televised football games? So there's a buildup of the brand and a widespread public familiarity of the players. So think um, uh, Jameis Winston in college or two, two, uh, two, two, uh, two, uh, two, uh, two uh, <laughs> Tonga <laughs> Bailoa. <laughs> right. yes. Think of, think of uh, uh, a player like that, or Johnny Manziel would be the key because the ESPN built the whole football season about him. And right. um, so if, if you think of, that that's going to be number one. Number two is going to be how intense the affinity group is. So, mm -hmm. for example, one time when I had Ben Roethlisberger, Pittsburgh may have at that point three hundred fifty thousand people. Los Angeles had you know four million, but we sold three hundred fifty thousand Big Ben T-shirts. The yeah. buy rate was every single person. <laughs> Um, uh, is reflected in a number where they would have bought one. And, and so there's an intensity to certain alum groups and, and to certain cities where, because they're so much more fired up and yeah. it's much more centrality in their life than they, um, than they buy at a buy rate. Um, and we, we see that in the NFL. You wouldn't think a city like uh, Green Bay, for example. Sure. Uh, but look at Aaron Rodgers and the number of ads he does. Green yeah. Bay is a tiny city, but they're, they've got an intense following and a national following. And many of those alum bases are spread out throughout the country. Sort of after NIL, a, a quick question about just the recruiting of, of, of athletes because that's so interesting. Um, as a sports agent, when do people in your company, in your business, start getting an understanding of who the top players are? Is this something, and I ask that because, and, and I'll use Patrick Mahomes as an example in high school, he didn't look like he was going to be the next great NFL quarterback. He had developed and developed physically and, and skill wise and went to the exact place where he should be in the NFL. And, and that worked out. Is this something where you kind of have an understanding of, of what the best high school quarterbacks look like? Has that changed with NIL? Or is this something as they, they get to college and then you get a feel for it? It's not NIL that changed that. It's, um, it's seven on seven camps. It's the mm -hmm. fact that at a high school level, parents are hiring uh, coaches for their kids to be quarterbacks. We never used to have that. So now all of a sudden, this player who maybe you wouldn't know till his senior year of college because of the maturation process, like a Carson Palmer wasn't a top rated pick until his last year and the very end of it just propelled him. So, uh, but now we're spotting these quarterbacks much earlier 
uh, teams will tell you uh, at that one position, you can spot them much easier. Now, big offensive linemen might grow 40, 50 pounds in college. So it's harder to tell at the high school level, but you make this good point in football. It was always true in baseball and, and true in basketball because of one undone. But in football, you could wait three years till the player was approaching his junior year at least until making contact with them. And all of a sudden now, if the marketing agent ends up being a person who also represents athletes when they turn to pros, um, and you don't make that relationship with the young player at an early point, um, as an agent, you might never get a chance to talk to him because he'll be happy with who he picked as a marketing agent and use them. So it's going to put pressure to move the uh, interactive level much uh, earlier. Talk about your agent academy a little bit, Lee. Um, is What kind of goes into it? What kind of people do you kind of see come through it? What are you trying to accomplish with it? Well, the goal really is to try to create a new generation of of well-trained, ethical, principled uh, young sports professionals who understand the power of sports, our philosophy of role modeling, where we ask athletes to retrace their roots to the to the high school, collegiate, professional uh, community, where uh, a Tua Tango by Loa sets up a scholarship fund at his high school in Hawaii, a, um, a Patrick Mahomes sets up a uh, a, a foundation that gives money charitably. So you're trying to get them to understand the power of sports and to be specifically trained. So in the agent academy, you break them into little agencies and they actually recruit a player. They have to recruit a top player. Many times we use a real player and mm -hmm. his family and they go through that experience. They have to negotiate a contract and half of them play general managers and half of them play uh, player agents. Uh, they have to set up a charitable foundation. We give them a marketing and branding uh, program. And um, at the end of it, we're trying to jumpstart their career. It's hyper competitive. So we're not trying to stoke unrealistic expectations because most people won't be successful. But if you give them the right training, you've got a higher success rate. And, um, and then we do the same thing for other parts of the profession working in television, working as a sports journalist, as a columnist, as a production person, uh, working on the internet, understanding those dynamics, marketing, branding, uh, charitable and community, the new technologies that are coming into sports. So we have panels. So if you go to SteinbergSports.com, we've got an agent academy coming up in, in November. And this is our gift back to a profession that's been um, uh, very generous with me. The last thing, and, and thank you for your time today. Um, you said in your TED talk that you got Steve Barkowski more rookie money than OJ Simpson or Joe Namath. You got to tell me the secret of how, how, how that was accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> well, really when I started, you know, there was no field of sports agentry at that point, Adam, a team could just hang up the phone and say, we don't deal with agents. Yeah. And that was it. That was the end of your representation. So um, we happen to have the good fortune of having a uh, World Football League in 1975 competing against the NFL. And in those windows, whether it was the World Football League or the old AFL or the USFL, those were amazing times for players because for the first time, they actually had an alternative and they had leverage. So Bartkowski was a big, blue-eyed, blonde, strong-armed quarterback coming to the football crazy south. And, um, um, you know, it was my first case, uh, but I'd been sued by President Berkeley when Ronald Reagan was governor. So I did understand leverage yeah. and uh, <laughs> understood that, that even if I was not the most... Uh, a uh, compelling salesperson in my first case, uh, it didn't matter because we had two leagues fighting over him. Right. Great. Again, thank you for the time, Lee. I appreciate it. It's been my pleasure.